Hello there. Okay, so this lecture is all about Franz Schubert, the composer Franz Schubert, and also the genre known as lead or art song. Art song covers um, all of these different types of songs in different languages. Uh, lead is a German word. It really just means song. But since the German-speaking composers tend to be the greatest masters of this genre. We sometimes just refer to it as lead because, because the Germans just were the best at this genre. Uh, first and foremost, Franz Schubert, the composer we'll talk about today, but also Robert Schumann, who was arguably the second greatest composer of lead, and Johannes Brahms, who we won't get to. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time left in the semester to get to Brahms, but he is the third greatest master of lead. And then various other composers like Hugo Wolf uh, and others. But uh, since the 19th century generally was kind of dominated by German-speaking composers, um, they tended to be the greatest at this genre, art song. So I'll talk about art song a little bit first. What is an art song? It's really just a song um, in the sense that uh, you are very familiar with listening to pop songs. It has about the same length as a typical pop song. It's three or four minutes long. Uh, it's for a solo singer and usually piano. Now there are some late 19th century art songs which are for orchestra and singer. But most art songs, the vast majority, are for piano and singer. And as with other types of uh, vocal genres that we've learned about already, like madrigals or, or, or opera, for example, with most art songs, the person who wrote the notes is not the person who wrote the words. The composer... Uh, takes the words which were previously written by a poet. And the greatest art songs tend to be written by, uh, the, the, the words, that is, tend to be written by poets who were German-speaking, uh, like Schiller or uh, Heine, and uh, set those words of pre-existing poems to music. And that's how you come up with an art song. Um, and, uh, the, as, as the book talks about in, in this section on art song, and I'm working here from, well, the section on Schubert begins at page 226 in the ninth brief edition. And, uh, actually the section on art song begins on 225, um, These, these songs uh, tended to be about the kinds of subject matter that we would associate with romantic poetry um, or romanticism generally. So romantic love, obviously a big subject, but also nature. A lot of these songs have to do with nature, have to do with the supernatural. Um, and in fact, the song that we're going to listen to as an example uh maybe the best known art song of all time and probably the best known by Franz Schubert, Er Kernisch, uh, the Erl King or the Elf King, composed when he was about 17 or 18 years old, uh, has all of these elements incorporated within it. Um, so these songs are uh, maybe an example of what I'd uh, mentioned earlier that the tendency of composers in the 19th century to gravitate towards either big monumental genres like massive symphonies, bigger than any symphonies composed during the classical era, or miniature genres, genres, types of musical pieces which are very concentrated and compressed and brief in time. Um, so the lead, or the art song, is an example of this kind of 
miniature genre because it's only they're only three or four minutes long. And uh, another example, which we'll talk about uh, in a future lecture, is the art song, uh, the character piece, also about three or four minutes long, typically speaking. Okay, um, here on page uh, 225, they talk about the genre and they talk about the forms of art songs. So remember, genre is a little bit different from form. So we have different genres of music like symphony, string quartet, concerto, what have you. But then we have form, which is a little bit different matter. It, it has to do with how pieces are constructed. When we're talking about art songs, there are basically two main categories and then there's kind of an in-between. Art songs tend to be either strophic or through composed or some kind of hybrid in between. Strophic simply means you have uh, different verses and the music is the same for each of the verses, even though the, ver the words change. So, for example, um, Pretty much any hymn that you sing in church tends to be strophic. You've got several different verses, and you might not sing all of the verses, but you've got different verses there, and the music repeats even as the words change. Most patriotic songs, Christmas carols, tend to be strophic in form. Through composed basically means non-strophic. That means that the... Uh, the, the music changes as the words change. Through compose is actually kind of a catch-all term for a form that is not strophic. But then there's kind of a middle ground, uh, which we might call modified strophic, where some of the music is repeated as we go through different sections of text. And in fact, the Errol King the the piece that we will listen to, actually you will listen to it, if you click on uh, the playlist for the Romantic Era, you'll see a couple of different links for a couple of different recordings of the Errol King by Schubert. And Errol King is an example of modified strophic form, where we do have some repetition, but it's not exact repetition, such as you would find in, let's say, a typical hymn or a Christmas Carol. Um, continuing on page 225 here, they talk about the song cycle. So it turns out that sometimes composers will uh, write a, a series of songs that are meant to be performed together as a set. Maybe a dozen, 15, or 20 different songs, each of which have their, uh, their own beginning and ending, but which are meant to be performed as a sequence because there's sort of an overarching story to the whole sequence of songs. That's what we call a song cycle. This is relatively rare. So, for example, Schubert, most of the 600 or so songs that he composed were not part of a song cycle. And the same thing was true with, with Schumann, the other Schu composer, the number two composer of art songs. Most of his songs are not part of a song cycle, but this is something sort of to be aware of, that some composers um, composed song cycles, and probably the, um, the thing that is most analogous to this in contemporary popular music is like the concept album. So, for example, Pink Floyd, The Wall. I'm probably dating myself here, but it's very popular, oh, about 40 years ago or so. Pink Floyd, The Wall, the album, tells sort of an overarching story, and there are, you know, whatever, maybe uh, 15, 18 different songs in the album, um, but there's an overarching story to them. And you can listen to each individual song, and it kind of stands on its own, but there's, uh, if you listen to the whole thing, you kind of get the whole experience. Pink Floyd, The Wall is kind of an example of a contemporary song cycle. Um, 
All right, so that's uh, the, the song cycle is fairly easy to understand. It's it's the genre that is most similar to what you are used to if you grew up listening to you know popular music on the radio, whether it's country or rock or even hip hop or jazz or whatever. It, it tends to be packed in these three or four minute songs, and that's really what a a romantic art song is. And, and this is kind of a new genre to the romantic era, in a sense. Now, there were these kind of art songs uh, in the classical era. Mozart, Haydn, Beethoven all wrote these types of songs. But the difference is, for those three classical era composers, Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, the art song or lead, lead is just the, the German word for song, wasn't really considered a serious genre. It was kind of a, a little something you would do on the side. It wasn't considered uh, a work of major importance. The important works of the classical era were symphonies or operas or piano sonatas or concertos. But as we move into the Romantic era, these kind of miniature forms, which were not taken terribly seriously uh, during the Classical era, were seen as uh, potentially important, serious genres, even though, even though they were brief and concentrated. And Schubert uh, took this genre perhaps more seriously than anybody, and that's why he's known as the greatest songwriter of all time. And I think that's definitely deserved. In fact, uh, sort of segueing into talking about Schubert now, I would say that um, Schubert is uh, right up there with Bach, Mozart, Beethoven. I mean, most people kind of have a general understanding that the, the three greatest composers are... Bach, Mozart, and Beethoven. And I think probably most classical musicians would say that Bach is number one, and Beethoven and Mozart, we can argue about, maybe they're tied for number two, or you can argue about who's number two, who's number three. But Schubert is definitely up there, I would say maybe tied with Brahms for number four, maybe, <laughs> okay? Schubert is, uh, is definitely a first-rank composer, and the, the tragedy uh, is that in his own lifetime, he was almost completely unknown and unrecognized. Uh, he never had great fame. Hardly any of his works were, were performed for big audiences. And part of this might be due to the fact that he lived in Vienna at the same time as Beethoven. Now, he was uh, quite a bit younger than Beethoven. Beethoven was born in 1770. Schubert was born in 1797, but he died just the year after Beethoven. Beethoven died in 1827. Schubert died in 1828, aged 31 years old. Uh, tragically early death, he died of syphilis. And uh, all, all of his life, uh, and that is, as a composer, Schubert was really kind of in the shadow of Beethoven. Beethoven was the great man, was the great composer in Vienna, where both of them lived. And Schubert was kind of a nobody, except for among his own friends. He had a certain sort of circle of friends, uh, close acquaintances, who knew him, and his music, and he would actually perform these little private house concerts um, in, in the homes of his friends and acquaintances called Schubertiads, where the music of Schubert would be performed, including these songs and piano music, chamber music. Schubert really composed all different genres of music. He did it all. Uh, he composed lots of piano music, Lots of chamber music. He composed nine symphonies, same as Beethoven. Composed an opera, composed masses, and he composed over 600 of these songs. 
the book uh, just focuses on Schubert, the songwriter, but you should be aware that Schubert did everything, composed reams and reams of music, was a tremendously prolific composer, kind of like Mozart. Um, now, unlike Mozart, Schubert was not uh, like a virtuoso performer on any particular instrument. He could play the piano uh, pretty decently, but he did not have the kind of um, very illustrious child prodigy kind of career that Mozart had. Uh, Schubert was the son of a school teacher and a school principal. And in fact, this, this is the beginning of a kind of a pattern that we'll see in the Romantic era. Each of the Romantic era composers that, that I'll talk about and the book talks about, like Schubert and Berlioz and Mendelssohn and Chopin and Liszt and Schumann, etc., none of them were the sons of professional musicians, unlike, for example, Bach or Mozart or Beethoven, all three of whom were this were you know in the music business from birth, right? Bach's whole family, they were all professional musicians. Uh, Beethoven's father was a professional singer. His grandfather was a composer. Uh, Mozart's father was a court composer and among the greatest violinists of his time. Not the case with Schubert. He was, you know, born into a family of probably decent amateur musicians, but his father was a school principal. And so, as was the custom of the time, it was thought that the best thing for a young Franz to do would be to become a school teacher like his father. And so he was sent to a teacher's college. He was trained to be a school teacher. He got a job at his father's school, but this just wasn't the life for him. And uh, this, it, it didn't, it didn't last very long. Uh, uh, Schubert quit his father's school and decided to, to devote himself full time to composition. And that meant, uh, well, well, he didn't have many gigs lined up. It meant kind of living a, a lifestyle that we might today call bohemian. He lived, uh, he, he never had a lot of money. A lot of times he had to sort of crash with friends. Um, he spent his days uh, in cafes, uh, just composing nonstop. Very prolific. That is, he composed reams and reams of music. Uh, probably, um, you know, much more music than Beethoven composed because he composed so rapidly and effortlessly. Um, so, uh, among the early works that he composed, this is, this would have been, you know, right around, you know, his teenage years, is this perhaps his, his best known composition, uh, the Earl King, composed in 1815 when he was all of 18 years old. And the text of the Earl King, um, again, not by Schubert himself, the words were written by uh, Goethe. If you've never heard of Goethe, well, this is a, a name that you definitely have to know. Um, Goethe was uh, sort of like the, the German language equivalent of Shakespeare. Now, he lived, uh, again, around the same time as Beethoven. He was a contemporary of Beethoven, um, lived in the, in the late 18th, early 19th century. Uh, but Goethe was basically the greatest writer in the German language and, and uh, a famous person, and is maybe the most famous German individual in the arts or letters in the uh, 18th and 19th century, uh, is a probably best known for his uh, play, uh, Dr. Faust, um, based on this very old legend of a college professor who sells his soul to the devil in exchange for ultimate knowledge of everything and all kinds of hijinks ensue. But um, this 
this text, Goethe actually um, kind of borrowed from German folklore, and it has to do with this character, the Earl King. The Earl King is a, uh, a sort of an evil elf who lives in the forest. And this is dating back to medieval German times, this myth that Goethe had based uh, this text upon. In the myth, the Earl King, or sometimes in different versions of the myth, it's the Earl King's daughters, either the Earl King or his daughters, who prey upon travelers who are riding through the woods. And if you think back to medieval Europe, um, Medieval Europe was heavily forested. The cities were much smaller. The cities and towns were quite small. And in between all of the cities and towns were these thick forests. And traveling was quite dangerous because going through the forest, it's dark. You can't find your way. There are wild animals. There are bandits. There are outlaws who live in the woods and prey upon travelers. So there are well-founded superstitions um, about traveling through the woods. So that might have something to do with the origin of this myth of this evil elf and his daughters who live in the forest. Um, and the thing about the Arrow King is the adults can't see him. It's only the children. The Arrow King preys upon children. And the adults can't even see him, but the, but the children can and this is borne out in the text. So if you turn to the translation, now what we have is the original German uh, by Goethe, again, adapted from this medieval myth. Uh, and this is page 228 and 229. And then we have the English translation along the right-hand column. Now, what's amazing about this song is that there are different characters in the poem, and the singer has to sort of subtly change his voice. This is a song for male voice and piano, and the singer has to subtly change his voice to, uh, to assume the character of each of these four characters. There's a narrator who kind of opens... Uh, the scene for us and also close it out at the end. So we hear from the narrator at the beginning and then again at the end. And then there is a man, father, who is riding through the woods with his son, a little kid, and then there's the elk king himself. But then there's also the character of the horse. Uh, they're riding a horse. And the character of the horse is uh, realized by the pianist. And in fact, the piano part of the Arrow King is extremely difficult because the pianist has sort of the, the job of, uh, of um, bringing to life the, the pounding hooves of the horse as he's racing through the woods. So the pianist has this sort of continuous right hand percussive octaves like na 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 uh, song, you're, if you're the pianist, you're, your right hand is kind of worn out. Um, so the, the, the pianist kind of sets the scene with this piano introduction with this sort of pounding hooves of the horse represented in the piano. And then the narrator is the first to speak. Again, each of these different four characters in the voice is, is depicted by the singer. And the narrator starts out and he sets the scene for us. And he says, Who rides so late through the night and the wind? It is the father with his child. He holds the boy close in his arms. He clasps him securely. He holds him warmly. And then the father speaks up. And the father has a low voice. Whenever we hear the father, we know it's him because he has this low voice. And he says, My son, why do you hide your face so anxiously? And then the son speaks up. And each time we hear the son, he has his voice in a higher register. So Schubert is deliberately setting these, these different characters in different voice ranges so that we can distinguish between them. And the son says, Father, don't you see the arrow king? 
The earl came with his crown and his train, the train being sort of like a long flowing garment. And the father says, my son, it is just a streak of mist. Now notice, the the son, the child, sees something supernatural. This, this weird being, the Earl King. The father has a natural, rational explanation. No, it's just a streak of mist. It's not the crown and train. It's just a streak of mist. But then the Earl King speaks to the child. The father can't hear. The Earl King says, Dear child, Come, go with me. I'll play the prettiest games with you. Many colored flowers grow along the shore. My mother has many golden garments. And as you listen to the song, you'll hear that as we um, come up to the place where the Arrow King sings, you think, okay, the Arrow King is this, you know, creepy, frightening, uh, evil elf character. The the music must get really sinister. But no, it's the opposite. It becomes kind of gentle and coaxing. And and the the manner of the Earl King's uh, speaking to the child, dear child, come, come with me. And it's kind of tempting the the child and trying to be ingratiating. I'll play the prettiest games with you. Many colored flowers grow along the shore. My mother has many golden garments. The son is not having any of this, and he cries out in panic. My father, my father, don't you hear the Earl King whispering promises to me? And the father says, be quiet, stay quiet, my child. The wind is rustling in the dead leaves. What you're hearing is just the wind rustling in the leaves. Again, it's just a a natural explanation, right? So we have the natural world. Notice that, again, that this, these aspects of romanticism that I talked about before. We have the natural world and, you know, the woods that the, the father and his son are riding through. But beyond that, we have this supernatural, the realm of the Earl King, which the child is in touch with, but the father is not. The Earl King speaks again. He says, my handsome boy, will you come with me? My daughter shall wait upon you. My daughters lead off in the dance every night and cradle and dance and sing you to sleep. Again, it's, and the music changes character. Whenever the Earl King speaks, it becomes very uh, sort of playful and charming. The sun cries out again. Each time the sun cries out, by the way, Schubert sets it at a higher pitch level to show this greater anxiety and tension. The sun cries out, My father, my father, don't you see there the Earl King's daughters in the shadows? And the father replies, My son, my son, I see it clearly. The old willows look so gray. So in other words, it's not the it's not the Earl King's daughters, it's just a bunch of old willow trees off in the distance. The Earl King speaks again, and this time he sort of just lays it out on the line. He says, I love you. Your beautiful figure delights me. And if you are not willing, I shall use force. The son cries out one last time in panic. He says, my father, my father, now he is taking hold of me. The Earl King has hurt me. And the narrator chimes back in at this point. He says, the father shudders. He rides swiftly on. He holds in his arms the groaning child. He reaches the courtyard, weary and anxious. So finally, the father reaches his destination with the child in his arms. They've ridden through the woods. They reach the courtyard, wherever it is that they were intending to go. And he looks down, and there's the final line. In his arms, the child was dead. Now, Did the child just die of fright? Did he just kind of scare himself to death? Was he just kind of hysterical, feverish, or whatever? Or is there really an Earl King who kind of zapped him and uh, did whatever the Earl King does? 
it's it's left a little bit ambiguous, you know. In the in the best tradition of these kind of gothic horror tales, uh, sort of like you know in uh, you know Edgar Allan Poe or whatever, it's it's a little bit uncertain whether this is all in the imagination of the child or is this a real thing. So. Um, uh, this is this this song by Schubert is a, a, just a, a total masterpiece composed when he was 18 years old. Um, I've put two different recordings of it on uh, my playlist. Now, one of them has uh, some graphics so that you can you know some video so you can get a get a sense of the story, and the other one is a, a recording. And it's, it's, you can see it's pretty old, it's black and white, but um, the, the singer um, in that uh, particular recording, uh, Dietrich Fischer Dieskau, is, is, is really just the greatest singer of these kinds of songs. And so that's a, that's a really classic recording. So I urge you to listen to both of them. And uh, next time, we will talk about uh, another composer, very different composer, but uh, dealing with some of the same kinds of subject matter, this kind of fascination with the macabre, the supernatural, and that composer is Hector Berlioz. So next time we'll talk about Hector Berlioz and the Symphonie Fantastique. Um, so we'll see you then.